Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. Here's your host, Tom Bourne. Hi, and welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. I'm Tom Bourne, your host today. Today with me is Michael Playwright from Working Well Together. Welcome, Michael. How are you? I'm not bad, Tom. Yourself? Uh, very well. Perth is beautiful this time of year. It's a it's a mild day, but it's 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 wonderful. Where are you based, Michael? So down here in chilly Melbourne. It's a bit cold today here, unfortunately, and a little bit sunny. But hey, we're heading towards spring and summer. And the, and the AFL finals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> All right, uh, Michael. Can you can you tell us a little about bit about working well together? and what it actually does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Working Well Together is focused on workplace bullying prevention and management. So, so fundamentally um, managing psychosocial risk and, and trying to provide a safe environment for employees. You know, and I know that this is a very stere a stereotypical thing to say at the end of the day for, for employees to go home safe and well. But, you know, as, as we all know, you know, for many years, health and safety has been focused on um, the physical aspects. And it's only now really starting to get its head into um, preventing the psychosocial risks and trying to manage those effectively or prevent them from happening. So I do a few things in relation to that side of things. One of them is, you know, workplace education. Though I tend to like to steer away from the just doing the, you know, what is bullying, what isn't bullying, what's the legal compliance, what, what's all that sort of stuff, because it doesn't help in the long term in the preventative strategies. You know, quite often what we get with, with training is that, that organisations focus on the, the legal stuff, but it's all reactive, what I want to do with organisations is say, well, what are the strategies you need to put in place to be able to prevent it from actually happening and, and occurring in the workplace? Mm -hmm. So there's that side of things. But there's also the two or, or working with individuals who've been part of the bullying process. And what I say with that is part of that is working with people who actually use bullying and abrasive behaviours. So leaders is mm -hmm. where a key focus is. And working on them to be able to change their behaviours so that they're not um, abrasive and they become a really productive member of the workplace type of stuff. I think one. I think it's probably, in some ways, it's the most exciting part of it for me, because what we're trying, what I'm trying to do is is trying to actually get people to think about those people who use bullying behaviours as humans, because they're so demonised all mm. the time. You know, if you hear, you know, people who use bullying behaviours, they're called demons, they're called psychopaths, they're called narcissists, they're called, you know, snakes in suits, you, they're called every swear word under the sun, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, these people are human and with some work, many of them can change their behaviours. And the thing for me is over the years, I've seen so many people who use bullying and abrasive behaviours move from one spot into a workplace to another to another so they're transferred between departments mm -hmm. or they just go to another workplace and use the same behaviors so so part of what i do is how can we change these behaviors so that the ongoing risk is potentially mitigated and these people you know who usually have some fantastic technical skills actually become productive members of the workplace just re by refining some of those people management skills type of stuff. Or, you know, in some instances, it might be finding a job that doesn't involve people. You know, that might be some, what they need and, and we can work through that in coaching. And then the other side of things is, is around um, strategies for people who have been bullied in the workplace. And this is more reactive, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but it is also about, you know, helping them understand what's happening for them and how to build strategies to keep them safe. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it may be, you know, and for some people I work with them and, and I'm not a psychologist, but, but if I can sort of see when harm has occurred and say, well, maybe we should, you know, work on linking you into a psychologist to be able to, you know, help you through um, that side of things. And in the meantime, helping them strategies, develop strategies that keep them 
keep them safe. It might be, you know, a bit of, you know, what I call bully blocking and, and, you know, how do you put that line between yourself and that bully to be able to, to, to keep yourself safe in the workplace? So primarily, you know, what I do is it's employers who come to me and say, Michael, we need this. And I say, yep, fantastic. Let's pull it apart and, and let's work out exactly what you need to be able to try and build a longer term plan. And I think that's part of the exciting thing too, is that, you know, particularly now you've got more and more employers starting to talk about, well, how can I, you know, create a safe environment for my employees? I mean, if you look right now, Mm -hmm. you've got a significant, you know, problem in the workforce with people coming and going and, um, and, and, you know, getting harder to find employees. So, employers are starting to think, well, what do I need to do in terms of my work environment to be able to attract employees? And that is, you know, the things around psychosocial safety. So um, hopefully that answered the question, (laughs) the first question anyway. Uh, That was good. I like what you said about addressing um, people with abrasive behaviours, addressing their behaviour because, yeah, my 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 experiences in life is that you're right if you don't change or you don't address the behavior the person tends to go from one workplace to another or within a workplace they get transferred to department 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 Mm -hmm. and the behavior continues um and perhaps perhaps they struggle to believe there's anything wrong with the behavior to start with so no that's excellent yeah yeah and and i would just say there too and you're absolutely right so, so what happens, Tom, is that with a lot of people who use abrasive and bullying behaviours, they, they did learn it when they were kids, right? Mm. You know, they, they, you know, when they were kids, they didn't have love, attention, whatever it was. And so as young children, they find strategies to adapt to get what they need. Then they go into the school grounds, practice the skills in the, you know, manipulation type skills in mm. the sand pits, and then go in the workplace. And, and no one turns around and says, well, you know, you need to change your behaviours. Mm-hmm. Or if they do, they say you need to change your behaviours, but don't say how. And what you've got is you've got in somebody's head, it's like anyone, we've had a lifetime of learning and we can't necessarily see outside of our picture of experience. So we've got to actually get in there and help them identify new ways of doing things, you know, to be able to, to learn new ways of doing things. Because if you say, you know, hey, you, you scream all the time and, and you've got to stop it. Well, they will be saying quite probably, well, what's the problem that's getting me results in their head? And in their head, it is potentially getting them the results that they need. Yeah. So, you know? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, bullying and harassment, there seems to be uh, a whole a whole raft of new focus in health and safety on psychosocial uh, conditions. Uh, They've been around for as long as I've been around, at least. Um, but yep. there, there seems to be a new awareness of, of some of the problems involved. In your opinion, do you think that the new emphasis on psychosocial hazards and risks in the workplace is because workplaces are more toxic or is it because workers have become more aware of that they don't have to put up with certain things in the workplace and are actually reporting them now. Mm, yeah. And look, and, and that's, it's, it is an interesting question and it's potentially, you know, a little bit of both of those, you know, I was reading um, just this weekend around, you know, um, incivility in workplaces and, and they were talking about, you know, what are the causes of incivility? And, you know, part of it was saying, you know, potentially it's the media is one influence. Potentially it's, you know, people on social media being able to, you know, vent without any boundaries. And therefore they're starting to take those, those, um, those behaviours into the, the workplace. Um, the other thing is, and what really interested me was that, you know, over the last few, you know, decades, what we've seen is that, um, and whether this is true or not, I, I don't know, but it was an interesting comment. It was around, well, what we've had is we've had, you know, a, a few decades of people saying, well, I need to be respected and demanding respect. Whereas, but what's not happened on the flip side of that is people aren't 
or asking the question, well, how do I respect others? You know, which is an interesting perspective for me. And it sort of, it sort of made me think. And, and, you know, there is a little bit of that. You know, what does it mean to respect other people? So I think we've got this, this general community issue, which is there. Look, I, I think there's always been that level of bullying and harassment in the workplace, and it's always been an issue. The problem is that people just haven't been able to, to speak about it or it's been devalued. I mean, mental health in the workplace or, or psychological, you know, risks in the workplace um, haven't really been something, you know, that's been able to, you know, been talked about for a while. I mean, if we look at it from a, a stigma point of view, you know, psychological and mental health, up until maybe the last couple of decades has been this taboo topic, you know. I can't say that I've got, you know, anxiety and depression in the workplace because then that will result in X, Y, and Z. Mm. And it's only now we're starting to try and break down those barriers. You know, you know, you look at the are you okay days and, you know, all those sorts of things, which is, or, you know, Headspace and the work that they're doing and or the Black Dog Institute. And you sort of start to look and think, well, we're trying to change a culture around mental health that's had a stigma for such a long time. And I think that's slowly building and slowly happening, but it's still got a long way to go. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, um, do you think, because you deal with leadership, do you think that uh, perhaps there's been in the past leaders who have worked really hard to get into the best their positions and they've come through the ranks uh, one way or another and they haven't realised their health and safety responsibilities and particularly their responsibilities to provide a safe mental health workspace for their employers? Mm, yeah. Look, and, and I, think, I think I can name, you know, many, many people over the years who have got into those positions because of their technical abilities in doing the jobs, you know, getting, you know, producing widgets or, you know, my own background is, is in community-based organisations and, and they've been brilliant. Um, in some ways they've been brilliant, you know, practitioners in, the or in, in, in community organisations. But when it's come down to leadership, they haven't actually, you know, got the skills to be able to lead people. Oh, look... Yeah, look, and, and, and I would say yes. I mean, when you look at, in some ways, health and safety, and it will depend on the industry, I think, too. So in some ways, health and safety, you know, has sat in the side in potentially, you know, your office-based environments. And, you know, health and safety has done, you know, things like, you know, making sure your boxes aren't there so people trip over them and all those sorts of things. But it hasn't been there in a, in a mental health capacity. Um, if I think of a number of, and, and I've worked, you know, I, I suppose, you know, a significant number of small to medium businesses as well, they don't necessarily have the resources where they've got a dedicated person who's doing health and safety. It's somebody who's doing something plus health and safety. So, so it's sort of, there's this sort of understanding, but not that it's there, but it's, it's sort of like, well, okay, I'm not quite sure how you fit into this overall picture type of stuff. And I think that's part of our challenge. I think, you know, and, and if, if, if I look at, and I'll use myself as an example, you know, and I, in my 20s, went into, into management positions and I always knew that health and safety was there. It was part and parcel of it. I worked in small and medium businesses and I, and I stepped into health and safety roles type of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was only because I had an interest. The and I think what was problematic is is that unless you have a person who's really interested in those organisations, then it doesn't actually follow through necessarily. Mm. If that makes sense, and it doesn't become an embedded sort of process like it is perhaps in organisations with with bigger you know parts. But then the other thing is that, you know, while I had the health and safety responsibility in management, I had, you know, to manage teams generally, you know. So you've got all these competing interests. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reality is for, you know, your small to medium-sized businesses, well, where, do you, where, do, where do you, does that fit into it? And it's interesting because 
because I have noticed that one of the challenges is, you know, around a lot of these small businesses and a lot of people I talk to is that, that they don't really value the health and safety side of things because they're just so busy running the business, you know, or I've worked with medical centers where, you know, you've got GPs who really are responsible for who, who own the business, who are responsible for, you know, keeping it going. And this health and safety, the psychological health and safety stuff's on the side, but that's not what they're really interested in. Mm. Of stuff. So it gets pushed to the side. And I think you've got a lot of competing, you know, um, interest in those smaller businesses. Whereas the other, I've been in other extremes where you've got the larger businesses where I tend to think that, you know, health and safety in some ways is almost been marginalized. Mm-hmm. You know, it's there, we know we have to do it. So we do what we have to do, but then not really outside of that. And I think the, the larger organisations can potentially suffer from that too. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just from your experience, can you uh, tell us some of the uh, results of bullying and harassment in the workplace? Mm, yeah. Um, so you mean from a, from a health and safety impact, from an injury impact? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, or, if, or even from a business impact as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, look, and, and from a business impact, you know, you, you've got to have a look and you've got to, it's, it's all the typical stuff that we hear. It's, you know, staff turnover, you know, is one of the things. And, and, and you know, I know that certainly a number of organisations where bullying has been entrenched, it's not been unusual for me to hear something like 40 to 50% turnover every year in some organisations of their staff because of the culture in there and you know from if you look at that from then an ongoing perspective you know how much is it costing to recruit to replace to train all those new staff you know there's that side of things um the interesting thing that i tend to find is that the amount of money that's potentially spent on the end stage you know the the lawyers and the fees and you know cases that might go or or go to courts or actually be work cover claims the amount of dollars and resources that go into that side of things is is massive, you know. And and you know, and, and when I look at the work case, worst case scenarios and the court cases, you know, there was there was you know um, a case in you know Victoria which was you know a payout for workplace bullying, um, and it was six hundred thousand six hundred thousand dollars. But the court case went on for seven years. Mm. You know? So how much are they spending in lawyers' fees and all that sort of things? I, I think there's that side of things. I find it interesting because some of the organisations um, I have sort of worked with have sort of had this approach of if there's somebody who's problematic, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay them out, give them a big bag of money to get rid of the problem rather than manage it type of stuff, which, which then has a double fold of, you know, rewarding bad behaviour from my perspective. You know, as well as the organisation spending money on payouts instead of actually, you know, effectively, you know, say using those dollars on on what their purpose is, you know, what their their business goals are, you know. So you've got that side of things. Um, If you've got, you know, and and in this day and age, there is, of course, the problem with social media. You know, if you're a a poor employer, and I say poor employer, I should say that, um, people talk about it and people are, are willing to post it on social media type of stuff, you know, and, and you sort of look at it and you think, well, you know, it's particularly in this era when we can't get employees or employers can't get employees. Mm. How, do, how do they actually attract people when they're saying, well, if you're on the media or social media every day because of bullying, well, I don't want to go and work there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and if, from an individual's perspective, what's some of the things you've seen? Oh, look, you know, some of the some of the worst stuff I've seen has been around the the, you know, this I'll be quite honest, the suicide ideation, you know, um, at the end of the day, when you see um, people who have been worn down. And this is the real challenge of, of workplace bullying at the end of the day, is that because it's repeated behavior over a period of time, a lot of bullying cases go on you know, six, 12 months or longer, you know, there was, there was a, a case um, in the media that's been the media recently and a, a, a gentleman who was um, 
bullied in the same workplace for 20 years, yeah. you know, and, and, and he yeah. had this meticulous diary, you know, that he had been bullied for 20 years and he, and, and, and he passed away in outside out front of his workplace. And, and look, and I don't know enough about that case to know whether or to know whether it was suicide or an accident type of stuff, but I mean, that's the worst case scenario. And if you look at the research, like and one of probably the uh, defining report in relation to workplace suicide ideation was done in, in Scandinavia and released in around 2016, I was, or it was, I should say. And it was talking about that people who um, have been bullied are twice as likely to be considering suicide ideation. Mm. Um, there was another report around the same time, which was a meta-analysis of another 20-odd studies. And it found that um, that 57% of people who have been bullied are likely to have post-traumatic stress disorder type symptoms. Yes. You know, so we're talking about fairly significant impacts on individuals. And, and these are the sorts of things that take a long time to get over. So if we're talking about, you know, work cover claims, it's no wonder that mental health work cover claims actually take so long, you know, because... Mm-hmm. People who've been bullied or psychosocial injury usually are off for, for months to years if they ever come back to the workplace, you know. And, and this is fundamentally why prevention is the best approach to this side of things, you know. And, and bullying has, the, has this perfect opportunity to be able to intervene early because it's, it's not bullying is is, you know, the three things. It's repeated unreasonable behaviour that creates a risk to health and safety. Well, the injury really comes, you know, a few months after the actual behaviour. So we've got to teach people to get into this spot of, um, of, of preventing the injury way back here rather than actually leaving it, <laughs> it happen. Oh, and, you know, and, every, and now you've got to do a workplace investigation. Well, it's too late. The damage has been done with true bullying. Right, and and I, it's and even those minor things that we don't think of. I I remember I was working with with one woman and and she was talking to me and she was being bullied and she was losing her hair and the stress and the anxiety of her losing her hair, you know, it exacerbated the whole experience. You know, for guys, you know, it can be a little bit easier, you know, if you're losing your hair, you know, but for a woman to lose her hair, there was there's a whole range of things that goes with that as well. So. You know, you've got the, the the psychological, which then comes out in physical ways, and and you know this is part of you know all part of what we can prevent. Mm. It's completely preventable. Would it be better, even in a workplace where there is no reported bullying and harassment, that perhaps some level of fundamental education of managers and particularly new supervisors are coming through happen before we get into that culture shift or before anything actually happens in order to stop it before it happens. Mm, yeah. Look, and, 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 and as I think it, it's, it is really important, you know, that early on that people get an understanding of the, what happens and how injury happens to be able to intervene early. Right. And I think there's a key challenge that we've got here with education is that for so long our focus has been in terms of um, certainly in terms of bullying has been on the end result that we haven't enough spent enough time to talk about preventative measures and this is where it really comes down to it is because if people go into a leadership position and they have no idea how to prevent you know psychosocial injury then you're you're three steps behind or how to recognize psychosocial injury right because I can, I can tell you, you know, the, the, the list of bullying behaviours, you know, from, you know, the overt abuse through to the covert, you know, I'm withholding information and evidence from you to be able to do your job so you're looking competent, you know, all of those sorts of things, right? And one, so people have to be able to be educated in what those behaviours are so they can recognise them early and intervene. But then the other thing is that people, and particularly in leadership positions, need to be taught how to intervene as well, you know, and, you know, and certainly, you know, the the psychosocial or psychological safety, 
stuff is actually a really key thing in my experience to be able to prevent and for people and leaders to be educated in because psychosocial um, psychological safety so I'll get that right um, is about teaching people how to get their teams to speak up when there's a problem how to create the environment and culture where they feel safe to do so right and so I think it's really important that we teach leaders those skills early so that they can create a team where risks are being raised early and, you know, put your potential risk in this situation of bullying type behaviours to actually be able to intervene and stop then the escalation to, to full on, you know, bullying. So, and because quite often what we're finding is that, or what you do find is that, that bullying starts as some minor or well, what's perceived as a minor conflict back here. And then all of a sudden it goes out of control because people don't intervene and don't act. So, so that teaching leaders around you know what they can do early is really key and and some of that stuff I tend to think of is you know how do I also mentor and coach my team in terms of when there is conflict in my workplace as well you know it's not just about making them feel safe but this but this is a thing you know at some point in time we've also got to bite the bullet and say well are we loading up our leaders and our managers too much with another psychosocial risk, which is unachievable work, unachievable workloads, mm. you know, because yeah. if we don't manage that, if we don't balance that, then then they're going to be under the pump too. True, true. Um, in your opinion, is bullying in the workplace underreported? Hmm. Look, you know, you look at the official data. Right, and and you know if you you look at the um, the workplace barometer report, workplace barometer says that bullying is about ten percent. Um, you know, and in, in, in six in a six month period, I should say, and across a lifetime, it's around forty percent of employees would be, would be bullied. I actually am not one hundred percent sure when we talk about the under under reporting question. Right. And the reason I I say this is because a lot of my colleagues and my peers will talk about, well, you know, who do investigations, for example, will um, will do that sort of thing of they'll say to me, Michael, you know, most of the incidents I investigate, you know, aren't bullying. Right. And. So, but what I tend to have come to the conclusion of anyway is that in some ways, whether it's bullying or not is irrelevant because the perception that somebody has that they're being bullied is actually what's going to impact them on them on, on a mental health platform, point of view, yeah. right? So it doesn't matter if I've been bullied or not, you know. And look, and, and I will be quite honest you know here you know I you know initially um got into this field because I had my own experience of of workplace bullying many years ago and you know and I look back and I you know ask myself was I bullied or was I not you know and other people you know when I've talked about it and I've worked it through have said Michael you were bullied you were bullied you know type of stuff you know, but in my own mind, I still have this doubt. Was I bullied? What? But realistically, from my perspective, whether I was bullied or not was irrelevant because the behaviours that I experienced, and I'm going to be honest, some of those behaviours were really quite shit. I'm going to use this term, shitty, excuse my, part of my French, right? Good. And, um, but at the end of the day, they had such a negative impact on undermining my own um, belief systems in undermining my confidence that it took me down this spiral, Mm. you know. So whether it was bullying or not to me is actually irrelevant, you know, because this is what we've actually got to do. We've got to, you know, skill people up to be able to, um, to recognise that early. And, and look, and let me tell you, back then, didn't have the skills, didn't have the ability to recognise it myself. And it was because, you know, I don't know if you, you, you're familiar with the, the story or the, it's the frog in the pot 
of water. You put it on the stove, you turn the heating on low, and then it slowly builds up. That's exactly what happened to me. Yep. Right? So, and a number of the people that I've worked with on the one and one support, you know, program that I do, they've perceived that they've been bullied. And look, and let me tell you, some of them have been bullied in their current workplace. Some of them haven't been bullied in their current workplace, but perceive they have. Mm-hmm. Um, and But what I find is that whatever that experience is, that they're actually carrying either personal um, trauma that they haven't addressed or they've actually been bullied in another workplace and they've taken it into their current workplace. Mm. And this is what we've got to recognise is that people don't just leave a workplace and their past behind them, their past carries with them. You know, we are the sum of our memories. That's right. You know, at the end of the day. And what it requires employers and people who are in workplaces to do is to actually have empathy Mm -hmm. and to listen and to do all those things that connect and then help us create a safe environment for this person where they are so that they feel okay to be able to you know, get help when they need it, you know, to be able to have the real open conversations as a manager and say, well, you know, what I'm hearing is I actually think you need help and I want to help you get help, you know. And and in many ways, this is not, not just the case with people who are the target of bullying behaviours. It's actually the people who, you know, potentially use bullying and abrasive behaviours. You know, I want to make this workplace safe so we can support you to get the help you need. You're not going to be judged because of it, but we want to help you to be better and to be well in this workplace because that's important to us. That's good. Um, in your opinion, um, my belief is, based on from what I've experienced in my few years around this uh, this planet, a lot of employees whether it's in the investigative process or whether it's under the workers' compensation, if they do make a claim, get so dissatisfied, they just leave that employer. They just go, it's too hard. Mm. Is is that a common thing? Am I on the right track there? Yeah, look, and I think a lot of people will and and look, and this is this is the ultimate problem, you know, and this is the, as I say, this is the Um, this is the crappy advice I have to give people is if those people at the top of an organisation are not going to change their behaviour, you need to make a decision of whether this is the best place for you, right? And the question is because you've got to have the resources to challenge a whole system, you know, at the end of the day, if the employer and the people at the top are not listening and are not going to change their ways. Because, you know, and, and, as, and, and as I said, it's the crappy answer and I don't like giving it, but it's the truth that I have to give at, the moment, at this point in time is that if you want to go external, if you want to go legal, if you want to go to a health and safety authority, if you want to go down the Fair Work Commission, you have to have the personal resources to be able to do that, mm. right, and the energy and the, and the nous. Um, and, and it's not always that easy. And the power imbalance, because even now, when I look at, for example, the cases that we've we've had, even the high profile cases, you know, the the Brittany Higgins cases, or you know, the you know, even the uh, I think was it Lisa Wilkinson, mm. you know, you've got people who are in there pushing and fighting to keep the story down, you know, type of stuff. So you've got to have a lot of personal energy and resources to do that. And I know, you know, and going back to my own personal experience as well and and the people I talk to, I know that when I was being bullied, I was in too much of a broken state to be able to fight, right? So I think a lot of people do because they're, they're, while we talk about, you know, ultimately there are some average employers out there, there are some brilliant employers out there. There's some brilliant managers out there. And this is where it's, you know, where there's an opportunity to be able to get somewhere where you're going to be supported and where you are going to stay well. You know, ideally, of course, I want to see all workplaces prevent this stuff. Mm -hmm. 
you know. But right now, and this is the real challenge I find, is that we're not there yet. You know, physical safety has come a long way. And how many decades did it take for physical safety to get to that place? Mm. Psychological safety will take, you know, generation a generational change to really get there. Yeah, yeah. You know? All right. Uh, might ask you one more question, Michael, and we might have to leave it after that. Yep. All right. Bullying and harassment. Bullying and has- has harassment. Uh, usually seen to be the realm of HR to deal with. Mm. Because it is a, a workplace health and safety issue as well, would it be better for particularly larger businesses which do have health and safety resources available to them that health and safety advisors or officers are also involved in that conversation with persons who are victims or perpetrators or alleged either or either? Mm. Yeah. Look, and and I'm a firm believer in a collaborative model between human resources and health and safety, right? I think what we've got is that as time goes on, we've got this closing gap of responsibilities between the two. The real challenge is that I don't think anyone, the two industries have got together and said, let's clarify what roles we can play in psychological safety or psychosocial risk management in the workplace. Right. Yep. And, but in so many ways, I mean, because I look back and, and, you know, some of the work that I've done with employers has been pulling apart an incident that it has occurred and said, okay, you know where I can trace this back to or where we can trace this, this back to? We can trace it back to that your um, leadership and your coaching and your learning systems for those leaders that you put in this place aren't, haven't actually um, been effective. Because you haven't taught this person how to be a leader, a manager. You know, you haven't taught this person how to manage conflict. You have, you know, so there's, there's all that sort of stuff, right? And, and I think this is where health and safety can play a real key role is, is the root cause analysis side of things, you know. Um, and, and human resources, at the end of the day, human resources do have an important uh, part to play in this because there is the legal compliance around, you know, the Fair Work Act and unfair dismissal and all that sort of stuff, right? So, so you've got to, both departments have to come together to be able to work that line Excellent. and really manage it effectively. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right, Michael. All right. Um, I think we might uh, call it a date. Listen, Thanks again for coming on and sharing your expertise. I'm sure people will have got something out of this. I'm hoping businesses will listen to and uh, come and seek your advice because uh, I know uh, when I was looking for someone to uh, talk about it, I I thought of you straight away. But once again, thanks for coming on, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Look, and, and I just will make one last point. At the end of the day, what we do is we look at bullying and harassment training as being something negative, you know, that we are uh, that we need to change, right? Yeah. Workplaces need to think about how we can be positive in saying this is something we're trying to create. We're not trying to actually punish people. We're not trying to accuse people. We want to build something better. And that's the opportunity that employers have and that we can achieve together. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. All right, we might leave it there. I'll yes. speak to you soon, Michael. Thank you very Thanks, much for your time. Tom. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to Health and Safety Conversations with Tom Bourne. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week.